Thank you, Lord. His presence is so sweet here. Well, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Jordan, and I serve as one of the pastors. This morning, you got to see all of us today. That's pretty awesome. And I want to give it just a special welcome to some of our new guests here with us and celebrating Bruce's baptism. And we're just so glad that you're here um, to celebrate God's means of grace upon a child's life. And so we're grateful that you're joining us in worship. We are beginning uh, Lent. Can you believe it? We are here. Last week, if you were with us um, on Ash Wednesday, we started that journey of 40 days to the cross, really to Holy Week, and where we'll celebrate Jesus' resurrection. But this season of Lent is really all about returning back to God, reorienting our life around Him through prayer and repentance and fasting. It's a season of turning our attention to Him. And so we're starting this brand new series called The Invitation, because that's exactly what this season is. It's an invitation to draw near to God. We're gonna read uh, and hear several invitations uh, throughout the Gospels that Jesus gives to his disciples, to really you and me. And this is a series all about discipleship. You know, and we, we hear the language of being a follower of Jesus all the time, right? But what does it truly mean? to be a disciple. Most of us have, you know, somewhat I would say a narrow view of discipleship. We often think of it as a six week program for new believers, right? Or, you know, it's something that you do when you're ready to get serious about following Jesus. Or maybe you've heard it as some method of church growth. You know, all those things are good, but I don't think they're exactly what Jesus had in mind when he said, follow me. Simply put, if I could kind of work through a definition of a disciple, I think it'd mean this. A disciple is someone who orients their life around three things. To be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. Let me say that again. Disciple is someone who orients their life around three things. To be with Jesus. To become like Jesus. And to do what Jesus did. And our hope here at Stillwater is that if we really live this way, our lives, our communities, and even our city will be transformed. So I want to invite you to open up your Bibles with me uh, to John chapter one, if you brought them with you. We also have scripture up on the screen. But John chapter one, uh, John is one of the four gospels, uh, first-hand accounts of the life of Jesus. And John is a disciple, but we're introduced at the beginning of a a different John. And his name is John, and he's a Baptist. Not a Baptist, excuse me, in the denomination. (laughs) He's a baptizer, one who is preparing the way, like a prophet, uh, for the Lord, for the coming of the Messiah, whom all the Jewish people were looking and waiting for and anticipating. And in the beginning of this chapter, we see that he's come as a witness to testify that when he comes, this is what he'll do. And uh, in this, before we get into this passage, we see that John is testifying about Jesus and he actually baptizes Jesus himself. (laughs) And we see the Spirit of God descending upon him. That is Jesus and the Father. And the, the the heavens open and they authorize Jesus. This is my son whom I'm well pleased. And he begins his public ministry. But starting in verse 35, we're gonna see one of Jesus' first invitations to his disciples here. So let's take a look. The next day, John, that is the Baptist, (laughs) he was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, 
Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. Amen. So, here we have these disciples who were following John at the time, and John is one who is pointing away from himself and to the Lamb of God. And the disciples hear this, and they say, oh, oh, he's here, he's here, and they just start following Jesus. And it's interesting, as Jesus is just walking along, he senses someone's behind him, right? And he goes, what do you want? (laughs) And that'd be interesting, right? Like, they just started following, and then Jesus asked them, the first thing he asked is, what do you want? Hmm. A better translation in the Greek here might be, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? You know, every disciple must answer this question. And notice what Jesus says. He he doesn't ask who are you seeking, but what? You know, we don't know exactly what these two guys were looking for. It could have been maybe the removal of their sin by the Lamb of God, of course. It could have been maybe a confirmation of their nationalistic hopes and expectations of a Messiah. We don't really know. But this question, what are you seeking, probably stopped them in their tracks because it confronted their heart and their desires. You know, this question demanded that they articulated what they really wanted in life. And this question confronts us too, does it not? (laughs) The reader, it confronts us. What are you seeking? You know, you're here today in worship. What are you here for? Maybe it's to support your family in the baptism. Maybe it's to just come and serve. Maybe it's for the, you know, the family. Or maybe it's for love and belonging. Maybe it's peace, purpose, an immediate answer to a problem you're facing. Is it validation, comfort, or security? Or are you here, really, Seeking Jesus underneath that. Is this who you're really hungry for? I love how the disciples, they come right back at Jesus with a question. They say, Rabbi, where are you staying? You know, they don't outright tell him what they're really seeking. I'm not sure if they really knew how to articulate what they wanted. Because they had trusted John, his testimony about Jesus, the Messiah, But they wanted to see for themselves. Really, I think they wanted to become a disciple of Jesus and be with him. You know, I could probably imagine that these guys were just hoping that they would receive an invitation. To receive an invitation, because that's how it worked back then with a rabbi. You had to be invited from the teacher to come and follow. And guess what? Jesus does. Doesn't that speak to the core of our desire? Right? We all want to be invited. Even if we don't want to go to the party, you know you want to be invited to it. (laughs) Right? You don't want to be left out or excluded. We want to know that our presence matters, that we're wanted, that maybe for some hope that Jesus would be available. This speaks to this core desire that we were created in the image and likeness of God and that so we were designed to know and be with God. We were created to know him, to be with him. We were made to experience his love. And we all, we long to find our purpose, 
our identity, where we belong, where we're going in this life. You know, I don't think any of us really thirst for an idea or a belief system or just another church service. I really think we're thirsty for the living God. We are craving his presence. We want the real thing, do we not? (laughs) You know that song, Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing, Baby. I could sing it for you, but you know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Ain't nothing like the real thing. We want real love, (laughs) real relationship. We're all seeking God, whether we know it really or not. But we tend to fill that void with all the wrong people, all the wrong places and things. Some of us settle for something less, maybe something more tangible and immediate. The truth is that we've, we have sinned. <laughs> we have fallen short of the glory of God. That, that simply means we've fallen short of really what we were designed for. <laughs> because of sin, the, the image of God in which we were created has been distorted and broken. Our connection's been lost. You know, in that, this has affected the way that we see God. The way that we even see ourselves and our neighbors. We've even put our, maybe created our own image and ideas about God or what God says. We don't see rightly. Some of us are wearing glasses and our prescription is outdated. (laughs) We need a spiritual eye exam. Some of us are still walking in darkness. Can't see what's in front of us. But here's the good news. Jesus invites you to come and see. The invitation is for all. It's open to you. You don't need to wait. You don't need to wander or even wonder if this invitation is for you. Jesus wants to reveal himself. Jesus wants to reveal the nature and character of God to you. John 1, 18 says this, no one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. In Jesus, we see the unseen God. We can know who God is and what God is like when we look at Jesus, when we read about him through the Gospels, because Jesus came to seek and save those who were lost in darkness. He came to recover sight to the blind and to set the captive free. You may be wondering, well, how do I know that God loves me? God, he doesn't just speak words, but he came in the flesh to demonstrate love on a cross. That while we were yet lost in our own sin, dead. Christ died for us. He was buried and he rose from the grave so that you would have new life. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? John 6, 40 says, for my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. My father's desire is that everyone, not just select few or maybe you, no, anyone, everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall, see, hear that promise, have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. I love these promises of God. Jesus also says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We live in a very dark world, and I don't know if you're feeling 
darkness or oppression around you, Jesus says, I am the light. Come to me, follow me, and you won't walk in darkness. That doesn't mean that you won't face darkness or feel it sometimes around you. But the Bible says that his word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. I'm gonna have the light of life guiding me. I'm not alone in this. Christ says he will be my light and I can see clearly. Jesus says, come and you will see. But here's the condition. It requires humility and faith. It requires humility and faith to really follow him. Don't you think the disciples probably ha had to have some humility and a little get, bit of guts and grit to right, walk right up to Jesus <laughs> and ask where he's staying? Interesting. Verse 39, so they asked him where he was staying and they went where he was staying and they spent that day with him. What do you, man, can you imagine spending a day with the Lamb of God, <laughs> the Messiah, Jesus, right there? What do you think that their time looked like? You know, maybe they uh, saw where Jesus slept, where he ate and drank, maybe where uh, he went to the bathroom, right? <laughs> I don't know, like it's probably pretty ordinary. But they got to be with Jesus. You know, I don't think it really mattered to the disciples what they were doing, where they were going, how ordinary it was, as long as they were in the presence of the Lamb of God who was extraordinary. And they recognized that. They had the opportunity for uninterrupted conversation with Jesus. They could ask all the questions. Jesus probably sharing his heart with them. What a gift. It was an opportune time. And these guys seized the moment. In the midst of a culture, right, where they were in, as we could probably relate, but it was loud and busy and buzzing with all kinds of religious conversation and so many things were competing for their attention. But the moment that Jesus invited them to come and see, come, come be with me, come, come be involved with me, they didn't hesitate. No, they were, they were ready as they wanted to see for themselves. You know, we cannot be a disciple of Jesus from a distance. And we can't live off of someone else's testimony or spirituality. We can't live off of TikTok videos and Instagram reels. As much as they're great, that's not how our spirit is nourished. Friendship with God is personal. When we realize, when we're spending time with God, we're in the presence of a real person of the Trinity. Wow. You know, it requires time and space as if we were meeting with someone here, right? Right? It requires intentionality. Husbands and wives, or those that are maybe single, you have friends, it doesn't matter. Y'all got to get to know each other's love languages. Am I right? <laughs> got to get to know them. I think one of God's love languages, he probably has all of them, is quality time. You know, someone with the love language of quality time wants for you to be fully present. Put the phone aside. Put the work aside, the emails aside. I want to just be with you. Can we just be with you? It really doesn't matter what we do. Can we just be any quality time people here? You get me. <laughs> this is God. You know, it takes effort to get there, maybe if that's not your love language, but it also takes vulnerability. Vulnerability to even be in the silence with someone just the space. But hear this, 
Jesus invites you to come and be with him just as you are. Just as you are. You know, with, with your curiosity, your questions, your doubts, or even your strong emotions. Because God isn't afraid of your mess. And he won't abandon you in it. Hear me. We're free to come to him with even our anger, our bitterness, our jealousy, our feelings of insecurity, our broken hearts, even our fears, whatever. <laughs> but he loves you too much to not let you stay that way, to let you stay that way in his presence. Because in prayer, we come to him just as we are. I'm so thankful because I don't have to perform in his presence. <laughs> you hear me, right? But I come in prayer in the presence of the Lord and here is the grace. We get to make an exchange. What do I mean by that? When I come in the presence of the Lord with my anxiety and fatigue, I say, here, Lord, this is what's going on. And he gives me his peace. I come to the Lord with my sin and my sorrow and he, in exchange, gives me his joy. I come to the Lord with my nothing and he says, look, if you make room, I'll give you everything. We gotta be vulnerable enough to even ask for it. Are we even open enough to hear God and say, well, what do you have to say about this? I promise you, like when I'm in the presence of the Lord, I'm so thankful for just the, that moment to hear the truth, to be vulnerable, to be real, and then allow the Lord to speak. This is the Christian life that Jesus wants to give you himself, but he also wants you in the exchange. There's transformation in his presence. So here's this invitation. Come and be with Jesus. And then he says, you're to become like Jesus. Because when we see him for who he really is, do you know that you actually will see who you really are in his eyes? Check this out. In verse 41, we see this. Right when the first thing that Andrew does when he has an encounter with Jesus, Andrew's eyes are being opened, right? He's like, oh my gosh, we found the Messiah. And he's, the first thing he's got to do is tell his brother to come and see for himself. Verse, in, that, in verse 42, what do we see? <laughs> that as soon as Peter walks into the room, Jesus looked at him <laughs> and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Now, can you imagine? <laughs> Peter just walking in the room like, whoa, buddy, we just met and you're now giving me a new name? <laughs> like, that's a little... <laughs> kind of far out there, a little intimidating. Um, it's interesting that this Greek phrase, the deeper meaning of just when Jesus looked at him, it doesn't mean he just glanced. It means that Jesus regarded Simon closely. He, he took a moment and he studied him with a locked in gaze with love and concern. Now I'm about you, but that, made me, that would make me feel uncomfortable. Like, <laughs> he sees me. <laughs> Whoa, what are you looking at, Jesus? Something on my, <laughs> my robe, I don't know. <laughs> but Jesus looked at Simon. He looked into Simon's heart and he saw him clearly. He saw all of Simon's strengths, his weaknesses, his hopes, his fears, his goals, his motivations. He saw the good, bad, ugly, and everything in between. But he saw him. You know, we, we know Simon as the guy, right, with the impulsive nature and a foot-shaped mouth, <laughs> right? That's what we read about Peter in the Gospels. That's who we think when we first come to our mind, right? But... Jesus here, when he's giving him a new name, he's giving him a new identity. And in essence, he is declaring what grace will accomplish in the heart of a disciple. 
He, he declares what Peter will become when he follows him. And we see this throughout the Gospels. As, as a result of following Jesus, Peter was changed. We, we see at the end of John's Gospel in chapter 21, we know Peter, the one who's impulsive and arrogant and awesome and, you know, Jesus, I'll never betray you, I'll never deny you. And what happens? He does. Three times. Out of fear. But at the end of John's Gospel... Jesus comes back to the shore and while Peter's fishing and he's like, I've given up. He's probably full of shame. And Jesus calls him to come, come back. I've prepared a fire and a little breakfast and he has this conversation with Peter and he restores him, forgives him. And he calls him back and he says, follow me, follow me. My mind hasn't changed about you. I still see you. In the book of Acts, we see this transformation when Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and begins to proclaim boldly the gospel. And you know what? He becomes one of the greatest leaders in the early church, writing even a letter to here. Do you know what Peter's name means? Rock, yeah. Little Rock. You can call him maybe in English, Rocky. <laughs> Rocky, right? You know, when God gives us a new name, it's often linked to one of his attributes. Because I think God, really what he's doing is he's redeeming our image and likeness in him. God is our rock. We see this, this name metaphor throughout the Old Testament, the Psalms, Deuteronomy. So Jesus, he's saying to Peter, he's like, you're gonna be a little rock built atop the bedrock of something much bigger than yourself. And namely, that I am Christ, the son of the living God, the chief cornerstone and the strength of the church, and I'm gonna use you to build upon this firm foundation. I'm not only inviting you to be with me, but to become like me and to do what I am doing. Do you hear that invitation? This invitation is for you. During this Lent season, as a staff, as um, in pastors, we've just been praying about what God is calling us to. And we really believe that God is inviting us to receive him. Just deeper and deeper into our hearts. Um, and so my question to you, in light of this passage that we read, if the Lamb of God were to pass by you right now, would you recognize him? Would you, would you have the humility to, to walk up to him, to ask him a question, to seek, to accept that invitation? Would you be open to hear what he sees in you? Would you be willing to trust what he says when he calls you to follow him? That's the invitation. How are you going to receive him during Lent? Maybe you've known Jesus as your savior for X amount of years. Maybe, you've ne maybe you don't. Maybe you've just, you hear about the name of Jesus, but you don't know him. I mean, for me, I've known Jesus for almost 20 years. And while it's good and it's been amazing, I know that 20 years ago when I was 15, oh my gosh, no, it's been, no, a little less than that, I'm 30. I don't know, I can't do math, you guys. <laughs> but that was just the beginning. That was just the beginning. No, I was 13. Okay, the Lord knows. He knows. <laughs> the moment. It doesn't matter. Grace, it fills my whole life. All right. So, <laughs> it was just the beginning when my eyes were opened to Jesus being my Savior. But over time, my eyes were opened to seeing him as my healer, as my father, 
as my provider, as my good shepherd, there is always more to see in Jesus. And it's something that can't really be explained. It must be experienced. And so I don't know where you are today, maybe if you're facing a trial or a testing, but maybe it's an invitation to come and know God in a deeper way. For he's inviting you to come and see. And friends, If you accept that invitation, Jesus promises that you'll never be the same. Let's pray. Oh Lord, I thank you that you're here. I thank you that you've drawn us near. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you just fill this room, continue to fill our hearts and reveal the beauty of Jesus to us. Tune in our awareness. God, I ask, Lord, whatever it is that we need to see in you, would you bring that up to the surface? Would we be open enough to even ask for you? So come, Lord Jesus, reveal this part of your heart and nature to me because I need you. Would our sacred smallness, (laughs) would we be okay with our sacred smallness in light of your greatness, God? Like little rocks, (laughs) that are built upon the rock, the cornerstone of Jesus. Lord, we give you our lives to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.